combined with grinding poverty. A lot of the oppression is gone, but the economic hardship is about to get even worse. In Egypt and around the region, a combustible combination. Jane Arath, Al Jazeera, Cairo. Let's get an expert view now from Peter Middlebrook, uh, who is the managing director of the consulting firm, firm Geopolicity Incorporated. He joins us uh, live from uh, Dubai. Uh, Peter, I suppose the difference uh, between Tunisia and Egypt uh, compared with Libya is that they're both energy importers as opposed to energy exporters. No, and I think what, what we're seeing, which is, I think, the, the core part of, of, of the strategic challenges faced by the Middle East at the moment, is effectively a twin Middle East growth future. You have economies which are, of course, exporting oil, and with reasonably uh, buoyant international oil prices, they are, well, forecast this year by the IMF to have growth in the region of 4.9%. Uh, but there's another side to the story in the Middle East, which are those economies which are really struggling under the, uh, the, the, the price of in, the bit, uh, being importers of oil. And at the same time as the uh, uprising is taking place, these governments are really struggling to uh, find sources of revenue to have the significant increases in public expenditures which they are committing. In the case of, of, of Syria, for example, the government has forecast for 2012 uh, up to a 59% increase in expenditures. The question is, how will this be financed? And in countries such as Libya, where uh, GDP, uh, uh, the, the overall productivity of the economy, has decreased by up to 50% this year, the structural fiscal challenges faced by many of these economies, which have been worst hit by the Arab Spring, have really yet to be felt. All right, so where should countries uh, like Tunisia and Egypt, for instance, I mean, Syria is a, a, an entirely different case, we'll leave it aside for a moment, but uh, uh, Tunisia and Egypt, where should they be looking? Perhaps should they be going cap in hand to their regional, richer uh, oil exporting neighbours or to the IMF? Well, I mean, I think what, 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 we've, what we've tried to lay out is that both of these countries, as with others, they have a unique set of challenges. But there is a storyline here. If you look at the UAE and you look at the Qatar, countries which are heavily integrated within the regional and global economy and allow high levels of foreign direct investment are, are generally being, uh, the level of productivity is extremely high. For Egypt itself, it also faces another story. You've got a long-term decline in oil exports. Um, of course, that's being compensated in part by increasing gas, ex uh, gas exports too. But the long-term picture is they have heavy, very heavy subsidies in the economy that's true of Tunisia too. How do they subsidize through public finances some of the core and essential services under such an energy future? What happens if the price of oil drops? Well, if the price of oil drops, uh, of course, uh, it, theoretically it, it benefits importing uh, those countries which are, are a significant import of energy and would have the opposite effect on oil exporters, although they may ramp up uh, production as a result of that. But I think in many cases the, the strategic challenge faced by Egypt and Tunisia is once one has gone through the route of political stabilisation, is how does one chart a viable economic course that really does address the long-term structural challenges faced by the economy. A youth bulge, high levels of unemployment, declining um, uh, productivity, certainly in terms of foreign exchange and exports, and how does one finance uh, the, the perception that governments, to, to a large extent, are not delivering on, on many of the basic and essential services uh, that, that people are, are on the streets to, to request. Peter, good to talk to you. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Peter Middlebrook there, live in Dubai. It's a pleasure. Votes to decide Ireland's next president will be counted.